Welcome to Construction Genius. This is Eric Anderton. My guest today is Felipe Engineer Manriquez. He is the Director of Project Delivery Services at The Bolt Company. He's also the CEO and host of the EBFC podcast, and he is also a published author. Nice thing about Felipe is that he is an optimist, but he's also a realist, and he is deeply experienced in the world of construction and the benefits of approaching construction with an innovative, optimistic mindset to help increase the productivity, safety, and quality of the projects that you are working on. In our discussion today, we take a look at 2023 and talk about the labor shortage, supply chain issues, and generational differences, all in view of how these things can be mitigated for and processed in your business so that you can continue to build your projects profitably. There are tons of nuggets in our conversation today that you'll be able to use and apply immediately from the landmine of the hybrid workspace to how to implement offsite construction effectively with limitations to offsite construction that you need to take into account. We talk about how to proactively manage your schedule so that everyone is on the same page and everyone understands what needs to be done to execute projects profitably. So there's tons of great stuff here for you today. As I always say, enjoy my conversation with Felipe. Check out all the links in the show notes to his various resources. Well worth you exploring those. And thank you for listening to Construction Genius here today. This is Eric Anderton, and you're listening to Construction Genius, a leadership masterclass. Thomas Edison said that genius is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. If you're a construction leader, you know all about the perspiration, and this show is all about the 1% inspiration that you can add to your hard work to help you to improve your leadership. Felipe, welcome back to Construction Genius. Thank you, Eric. It's a pleasure to be back on. You know, it's interesting. I, I, uh, I like to bring guests back on who have something useful to share with my audience. And so I just, I want to give you the floor here because you're involved in the business. Tell us your perspective on the current state of construction. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, you know, right now we're, we're coming out of the, the pandemic. It's late 2022. And today in construction, we have a massive labor shortage. One of the biggest issues that we're facing now is that we do not have enough people to do the projects. And there are lots of companies, I'm hearing lots of examples across the industry from my peers talking about jobs that they have to pass on because they don't have the capability or capacity, more so the capacity to take on the work. And I, I heard a statistic earlier this year, so, uh, early in the fall, that uh, for all the construction jobs posted in the United States alone, over 1 million of those posted open jobs will not even get a response. Hmm. That is how big the gap is. So we've got uh, currently five generations uh, working in construction today, you know, for people getting out of school or people coming out of high school, going into the trades, all the way to executives and leadership, uh, running companies and people, you know, the plus we've got people in the industry now that are still working with the 40 years of experience in construction. And so five different generations from Gen Z to uh, beyond the boomers to the traditional generation, all working together. Let me not leave out the millennials and the, the Gen X as well. And you've got five very unique styles, five different spans, five different comfort levels with technology, uh, five different radically, radically different, depending on which one to which one communication styles as well. So that's some of the things that are, that are facing people. And then still uh, with the coming out of the pandemic across the world, we have the world global supply chain, Eric, we've got issues with procurement. We're st and we're starting to also see some procurement improve, but uh, even now for basic switch gear, lead times can be in excess of a year. So for a lot of people, and even some of the commodities we're seeing wood uh, was big during the summer. In the early fall where you could not get uh, lumber 
uh, to support your projects. And there were lead times and stories and people are remembering and probably you're, you're, you're traumatized a little bit. I'm with you. Yep. I lived that trauma with you where it was hard to get, uh, to get wood or even do things around your house. Even residential was uh, impacted pretty hard by the supply chain issues. So that's the state that we're in coming out of this. So not enough people. And uh, we have way longer than what we've been used to lead times for materials, even some commodity goods. Okay, there's three things there. And the first one is the labor shortage. Second one is the five generations in the workplace and their unique styles, particularly as it relates to uh, technology and then the global supply chain. Um, it's, you know, we're recording this late 2022, so we're looking at 2023. Please give me something new on how we're going to deal with the labor shortage because we've been talking about it and we and I don't see it ever changing right there's the right. both the the amount of labor available and the skill of the labor that is available so what am i supposed to do as a construction company owner to address that labor shortage what can i do yeah one of the things you can do is you can shift towards the easy thing is to take advantage of the labor that you currently have so don't force people to stick build because stick building or assembling, constructing on site, you know, raw good, receiving raw goods or raw materials on your sites, on your construction projects, and trying to put things together is going to tie up a lot of your labor. So take some of that key labor, move it off site, either into a, your own facilities or a warehouse facility adjacent, or if you've got the space on your project, create an area on your site where you can pre-assemble things in a controlled environment focused on prioritizing for flow. And some other companies are more sophisticated in this, Eric, and they've even gone so far as to create a design for manufacture strategy and implementation where they're shifting a lot of labor offsite into different facilities into controlled factory-like environments that are uh, well air-conditioned or heated, depending mm -hmm. on where you are in the world great lighting, much better facilities. And they're then shifting pre-assembled kit of parts we call, you know, prefabrication or kitting. And that is a great strategy where you can dramatically reduce on-site labor hours. You're still utilizing the craft, the genius of the people that put the things together for us, but you're creating an environment where hours can be shifted off-site and then those materials can be assembled on your site much faster. And we've got some examples of companies that have taken this approach and invested in this. Uh, the bowl company where I work today is, is one such great example where we've created a modular team and we've got a group of professionals that their full-time job is to implement these strategies on projects across the entire organization. And the so benefit has been... Yeah. And let me just ask you about that because I think that's the, the, the toughest challenge is that I know there's things I should do and I understand the logic of that. And yet it's the allocation of resources to that. So internally there at Bolt, how, how do you go through that process of number one, determining where internal allocation uh, resources need to be allocated that aren't necessarily directly project related immediate in the short term? And then how do you go about putting together those teams and disciplining yourself to focus on those things that, again, aren't necessarily building something on a job site today? No, it's exactly like you said, like we, we've been experiencing this at our company for a long time. We've got an aging workforce and we looked at the future and said, we're not going to have enough people because there's just not a pipeline like there used to be. Yes. So the countermeasure to that was to create this modular team. Yeah. So we created a couple key positions. Uh, and right now it's uh, head up by Mel, Mel Taylor's uh, help, helping with our self-perform and uh, Kloss is helping with our modular leadership. So a couple key people, some self-perform and purposely modular, working hand in glove together to make it available to all project teams where this is a, a, a need at the beginning. So like this is something we talk about in the pursuit phase. You know, what's going to be our strategy for design for manufacture, kitting, prefabrication, offsite assembly, and then we bring that as an option when we're pursuing work through the planning of the work and, of course, through the execution of the work. So if you're listening out there, I want to give you like two options. I want to give you the easy button and let me give you the more future long term. The easy button is that if you're on a job right now, 
all you have to do is talk to the trades working in your project and say, what capabilities do you have where we can do some kidding, some pre manufacture or pre assembly and just ask them. And then that's something that you can implement on your project on Monday. Monday, you can have a conversation with your key trades and just say, what capabilities do you have? What can we add to this job so that we can implement some of that? And if you're an owner of a company you're, or a leader on an existing company and you don't have any type of modularization or dedicated resources, look at the labor market, look at your own forecasts for 2023 and say, how can I continue to serve my clients, deliver projects reliably, reliably, but still segregate? You can start with making it some portion of some leader's time, or you can make a hire and bring somebody to that's got the experience to implement this at your organization. That's a little more of a resource commitment. So at the Bull Company, they made that commitment a long time, way before I got here, Eric. And I'm seeing the benefits of that. There have been case studies published on our website Go to uh, bolt.com and you can click on that to read case studies and see examples of some of these stories, things that we were able to even deploy during the pandemic with major supply chain issues, still successfully create clinics. Uh, there's a great example of the StatMod project. I'll make sure to give you a link, Eric, so you can sure. share that That'd be great. directly with uh, the listeners to want to read more of how that was done and how quickly you can pivot and be flexible. Let me ask you this then. Um, because obviously modular offsite construction, again, it's it's something that that does work, but it's also something that has limits. So, what are do you what what are the limits of offsite construction from your experience looking at yeah. at the industry? There's there's two big things to consider. One, if you're going to go to the most ex extreme example where you're creating like Lego inter interconnecting parts and pieces modules that you drop in. You know, one of the things you have to consider is you're going to add a lot of structural steel to that project. So mm -hmm. one of the limits is, can you afford to add that much steel? Because if you're going to create, like, let's say you're, for example, you're making bathroom mods and there's quite a few companies out there that make, you know, turnkey bathrooms that you can plug and play into your building. Even if it's a traditional stick built construction, you've got additional steel and reinforcing uh, for those types of things. And you also need to consider inspections, depending on where you are in the country. You might have to have some additional inspection expenses that you should pass on to your owners because the owner should be paying for this as part of the project costs where you're going to have to have inspectors go off to an offsite facility and do some inspections for things that they won't be able to see other than in the, the warehouse or the, the factory, if you will, where they're putting it together. So steel, additional weights, additional cost on steel beyond what's normal because of how these things come in, because they have to stand alone to be able to go down the highway, you know, on the road to get connected in. The other constraint that you're going to have is uh, engineering and design. You're going to have, in order to allow for some of this to happen, if you're on a hard bid project, you've already received completed drawings. Mm -hmm. So you cannot change unless through the RFI or bulletin process, whatever your contract allows, there's certain things that you cannot change uh, not easily. I mean, you could argue, Eric, that you could change anything with the right with the right change order. You can make it happen. <laughs> but uh, in, in practicality and reality, the engineer and the architect of record have already designed something that, that works and that's at least majority coordinated between the different design disciplines. And if you're going to introduce something modular to that already completed design, that's going to be a major design change. So that's a limitation. So a lot of the work that we do where we involve our modular team we're involved way early, even oftentimes at conceptual design and creating that strategy with the client and saying, you know, what do you want to achieve? And then we have to show them like, here's the benefits to the schedule. So you can have your finished building faster. Cause a lot of the things that can happen, even when you're still finishing your later design packages, if you have a modular uh, strategy that you're implementing, you can start to release those components into construction while you're still doing earthwork and some of the early trades. That's interesting then, because that speaks then to another limitation potentially of, of modular is, is the types of projects I'm building and the contracts associated with them, the way the contract is structured, the way the design is done. Um, do you, do you think that, you know, five, 10, 15 years from now, 
because of the advantages of the modular offsite construction and the impact on the project, the, the very structure of contracts and the way that um, um, construction is designed and bid is going to be changing? Or do you think it's, it's always going to have that hard bid design up front element to it? No, I think we're already seeing in the industry now a shift towards more design build. There are some statistics shared by the Design Build Institute of America that I'm going to totally not get correct, so I'm not going to put a number out there. <laughs> but I know that uh, the numbers that they share at the last conference that we had that I that I attended physically in Napa some years ago is they showed uh, an exponential increase in design build projects as a proportion of total projects let per year in the United States and specifically west of the Rocky Mountains. So all the states west of the Rocky Mountains saw an exponential increase. So this would be du double digit is exponential. So greater than 10% increase. I think it was more than 25% from memory. But again, we were in Napa, Eric, so you got to forgive me because wine wine was passed out at uh, many different breaks. In Napa? <laughs> yes, in Napa. <laughs> And so I, I want to say it was somewhere north of there. And then we're seeing on the on the East Coast as well, uh, an increase in design build projects. And a lot of the, you know, industrial projects have been this way for a long time. The EPC, engineering, procurement, construction, mm -hmm. industrial work has been, you know, this type of delivery model for a long time. We're seeing a reduction in the typical design, bid, build, hard bid, like you said. Mm -hmm. And so in those environments where the general contractor is now responsible there is an incentive there to do more of this modularization because it does improve the total construction time which is a great lever to pull on to be more profitable and to have an easier uh delivery as well so i um, think how, we're going to see those that's going to just continue to increase um how much of the work that, that bolt does is self-performed i'm just curious that's a great question. And I don't, I don't have that statistic handy. And this is like two days in a row. I've been asked the same question. <laughs> we, uh, we self-perform uh, about a dozen different trades okay. from engineers, millwrights, masonry, concrete, rigging, and people at Bolt listening. If I left any out, uh, you'll have to forgive me. Again, we'll give you a link to the website because this is all on our site. Uh, concrete, masonry, structural steel, operators, uh, mill rights. So I think it's, it's right around plus or minus 12, uh, different trades that we self perform. It's quite a bit depending on the geography. And then we travel across the entire United States, uh, including Alaska and Hawaii to do projects as well. Uh, and it would take us. I, I'm, I'm the, the reason I'm curious, I, I didn't hear MEP trades in there. Did I, did I hear that correctly? Yeah, we don't, uh, to the best of my knowledge, not at scale. Yeah. We have a lot of good, uh, really good MEP partners. Of course. That we work with and we travel with across the country. That actually will go with us across the country. Have you and found I that those folks are the ones who initiate um, a lot of the, the offsite discussions because th those are the types of trades that, that lend themselves the most to, to the offsite modular approaches? Am I am I correct there? Or what, yeah, what's so, that? And yeah. so for all the people listening that aren't super key onto the acronyms that Eric and I are dropping down, I'll just say them out loud. Mechanical, electrical, plumbing, fire protection, and framing trades. Those yeah. trades, MEPF, which we just – shortened to MEP. Hey, you just threw in the F there, man. Come on. Yeah. I threw the F. It's the first, <laughs> it's the first F of the show. <laughs> it's always going to be some, so no apologies for that. No, yeah. Those, those types of trades, a lot of the companies, especially the larger ones that we work mm -hmm. with Eric, they all have some capability and some yeah. of them are way more advanced than others. And, and even my experience, I've been in construction for over 25 years. I find that even small plumbing, I've, I've worked one time with a very small plumbing contractor and they utilized this uh, prefabrication and kitting on a project that was just under 100,000 square feet, two-year-long duration. Yep. And because they kitted and prefab, they were able to keep a four- to six-person plumbing crew on that mm -hmm. project and never miss a date because of, the, because of that approach. And this is from starting with the model um, and taking that model information, taking it all the way to things that they spool up and make in their in their site. And it was like to the almost bewilderment of the onsite supervision at times, like how small their crew could be, but the crew was consistent. It was the same people. Every time the quality was much, much higher. A lot of times you see on 
on crews that don't do this, the contrast is when you're assembling everything on the site, you can have uh, a lot of variation and fluctuations in labor. Like you might have, you know, 10 plumbers this week, 25 plumbers the following week, and then three plumbers another week, and then some weeks, no plumbers. And just to pick on plumbers for, for a second, but this is true of all the different trades right. that we mentioned. So I think having that, uh, doing use utilizing prefabrication kidding kidding is like the easiest thing to do yeah. i think most mepf people listening will go all say like to some degree they already use this to be right. competitive you have to to be competitive because there are there's the lack of labor like eric and i talked about so this is a good countermeasure for people to overcome that uh that labor issue just not having enough what about um when it comes to off-site just uh, construction and 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 the modular construction, what about the limitations of, of access? How do those create a constraint on, you know, effectively using modular and offsite? So I'm trying to access the site, but because of the nature of the site, the, the unique geography of a particular project that limits me. Right. So if you're, you're working in a space, let's say it has like zero lot lines, which means like you're building butts against, you know, buildings on two sides, three sides, or you've got uh, a roadway, like Eric's right, you're going to have limitations of where can you set cranes because uh, plugging in modular construction usually requires a lot of uh, cranes, heavier yep. cranes, bigger cranes. And sometimes that could be a limitation. And if we have that input going in, when, when we're in the early phases, setting up the site logistics, those things actually are considered. And we drop in uh, crane pick uh, maps and weights and yep. try to understand like, you know, are we going to get a uh, bang for our buck? Is there going to be a return on investment for going to this level of modular given the site constraints? Because sometimes it doesn't pay back. And so we do all that in the early phases with just sometimes just even sketches and some standard uh, crane charts that we have. And we can determine whether it has a payback or not. And then either scale back the modular or upsize the crane if it's going to give us uh, good schedule performance because that can turn into major savings for the client as well. Excellent. Um, let's pivot a little bit to the supply chain. So, you know, we've, we, we've, you know, heard the story repeated again and again, COVID obviously devastated the supply chain in many cases. We're recording this at the end of 22. So, you know, this will be going live in the first quarter of 23. What's your perspective on the supply chain for the next 12 to 18 months? Where, where, where are we going to be? What's, what's it going to look like? What do contractors need to do to, to prepare for that? Yeah, I think the, the, the first thing is don't guess. Talk to your your suppliers, talk to your vendors, talk to your preferred contractors, and just ask them to be transparent with what's going on, and you'll get really good answers. There's uh, strategies that you can implement, but I think I'm optimistic, Eric. We're seeing numbers and durations decrease, uh, even for things like roofing. And we forgot to mention roofing was one of the major things that recently became really challenged in the supply chain. But we're seeing durations coming back down yeah. to a little to what's like the new normal. Not not quite what it used to be in 2017, 18, to, in the early 2010s that we were used to, but the the things are starting to come back and we're seeing like improvement through the different ports. Again, it's a global supply chain. Yeah. So everything is coming from somewhere. A lot of components still come from across the ocean, uh, depending on what part of the country you're in. And so all that has to be considered. I think the best advice uh, is like, to temper my optimism, Eric, because I'm very optimistic, especially I, yeah, I can tell all you. the scheduling meetings that I'm in. I'm in a lot of schedule meetings yeah. with a lot of different project teams. And in general, I'm seeing improvements in those supply chain things. If you're on a project now and you're not talking to your your vendors and, tra and your trade partners, you're going to err on the side of probably being too conservative or too optimistic. You're just going to be wrong. Right. And I'd say take that schedule information that you're getting and if you're getting a range of like 12 to 18 weeks on something, plug that into your into your forecasts and just plan for it. Yeah. So at, at the Bolt Company, Eric, we utilize a system called the Bolt Production System, hmm. which is built on Last Planner System production controls. But it allows us a very standard way to look far into the future and look and make reliable promises in the short term. And so using that system for us allows us to take into account these long-term issues with procurement and then bring it into, you know, what are we going to make? It just makes it easier to manage on the daily reliable promising once we get to the putting work in place. With that in mind, then, um, 
what can a company do who, let's say I'm not the bulk company, so I don't have these particular processes in place right away. What can I do to begin to build those processes so that I can be more accurate in my forecasting? Yeah, the first thing you want to do is uh, don't assume that everyone can read your schedule, number one. Schedule is something that you use as a tool right. to have the right conversations and dialogue with your team. Like every single project, Eric, without exception, has at least two dates. Has mm -hmm. a start date when you're going to start construction and an end date where you're going to substantially turn it over or the owner takes beneficial occupancy of the site. So two sure. dates minimum. When yeah. do I start? When do I end? How you get there, all the in-between is the exciting part. And this is where a lot of uh, companies have a low-hanging fruit right now. You can improve that by socializing that thing. So talk about it. Don't just hand it to people. Don't If you're just emailing schedules or you're just printing them and, and giving it to people, you're missing out on having the dialogue. So the mm -hmm. first step is talk about the activities in meaningful ways with the people. Don't lecture people. Ask people, like, what does this mean to you? This milestone we're trying to achieve now includes... X, Y, Z, and does not include ABC, right? So it's both saying what's in and what's out. That's a very first step that anybody listening can do this. The other thing, step two, is make it visual. Put it on display. If you've got, uh, let's say you have a 65 page schedule and you're on a two and a half year project, that's not something you just paste up as wallpaper in your office. Right. Take some of the main work breakdown structure activities that roll down into some milestone type of activities or ham or my, for my scheduling professionals out there hammocks and just show those as a simple bar chart put some milestones up in your conference room with some key dates or show some hammocks or, or bar charts when you collapse your schedule to a more summary level and just gut check it when you're in meetings with your teams like talk through the sequence if you're not to the level where you're pull planning yet or using last minor system or other agile type of methods like scrum then just make it visual and then communicate with people. Use it as an excuse to have a conversation about what's in and what's out. Excellent. Um, you mentioned something earlier, um, your optimism. I, I, I want to ask you, I found, so I'm naturally a pessimist. I'm always waiting for the other shoe to drop. <laughs> and I found in working in construction that many of the people who are in the business are pessimistic as well by nature because they have to be in order to, or at least they feel they have to be in order to mitigate the risks and manage the risks. So how do you, as an optimist, maintain your credibility when you're in a room full of pessimists? No, it's a, you know, Eric, it's, it, you, you, you hit on something. I think you're right. That trend. I think ladies and gentlemen, and let it go on the record right now. Construction genius, Eric nailed it. Construction is full of pessimistic people because it takes one or two bad experiences that repeats multiple times that creates a pattern and people will assume, rightfully so, that bad things are likely to happen based on experience. The reason I stay optimistic, Eric, is because I know that using different types of lean tools and tactics, you can take the pessimistic worst case scenario type of thinking and create countermeasures to mitigate those risks. Almost every risk, I, I, I can't say every, but I'm saying almost, almost every risk can be mitigated and planned for on your team. And yes, there will be some variation. There'll be some uh, events like a global pandemic that you can't, you could not have forecasted what was going to happen when they call, uh, what do they call it? Force majeure type of yeah. things to use contract language. There could be some force majeure events, of course, but for the most part, the people on your team, they know from experience, like what are things that typically happen? And so planning with pessimists makes for really reliable plans. Interesting. Because you could get good countermeasures. And so I always like to ask people, you know, from based on your experience, where will this plan fail? And then we can take little pieces of that plan and create mitigation measures. And we can just make some decision points and say, if we see this happen, like if we see, let's say, for example, that uh, structural steel wide flange members start to become scarce or something, or we see like a change and there's a lot of data centers being built right now across the country, but that's going to start to come to an end as, as the different companies that are pulling those levers start to get to their saturation of where they're going to be. Yep. That's going to see, that's going to show a dip. So we know there's going to be a dip in, in demand for some of these commodity items. And we can ask people like, where do you think we are in this? 
and just let people with experiences saying, well, the last job I did was this, or the last three jobs I've seen this, or we have five projects doing this, and this is what we did. And when you take that information, you can change your plan. So the way that I build credibility with teams is that we change the plan live based on their input. And it goes from being our plan as the general contractor to becoming our plan for the project with all people contributing. And I think that makes a really big difference. And when you shift from the your plan to our plan, you start to implement some of that project first thinking, and then everyone starts to really put their hands around it. I see increased accountability. I've never had to have, I've never so far, Eric, this I can say, I've never had an issue with personal accountability on project teams because we're always making moves to shift to the R plan, collaborative scheduling, collaborative planning, using some of these lean construction methods and tools. And that gets us to have these different types of outcomes, radically different. And it has to do with our philosophy. And so I stay optimistic, surrounded by pessimists. And I love the pessimists. I, you know what I too love, Eric? I love people that say that lean doesn't work on this type of job. Mm. I hear that all the time, even now, even now where I work, sometimes people say, well, we tried this lean thing and it didn't work. And then I'll ask them to tell me more and they'll describe some process and I'll say, oh, when that thing happened, what did you guys do to experiment on that? And they're like, well, we just kind of like jumped over it or, you know, they'll have some reason as to why it didn't work. And I said, okay, now that we know that, could we try something different instead? Like, let's use your experience and build on it. And if they're still really resistant, Eric, my next go-to thing is to, what can we subtract? Like, what are you doing now to mitigate for something that might not actually be a risk on this job? What's some work we can take off your shoulders, not do, create capacity to try something else? So that way we're not piling on. Because people in construction, the people that are working, thank you, everybody, for your service working in our industry to build the world that we live in. Thank you for that. And I want to be someone that contributes to making that work easier and better. I don't want to be somebody that adds more work to your already heavy plate. So that those are some of the ways that I use my optimism, my enthusiasm to reduce burden for people, use the, the genius of each individual on the team to make it shift from I to we. Don't you love the fact that we don't have sponsorships on the Construction Genius Podcast. And that's why I have no problem taking a quick break in the middle of the interview today with Felipe to remind you about my book, <laughs> Construction Genius. This is a great book for construction companies who want to improve their leadership, their strategy, their sales, and their marketing. This is what you should do. Go out to Amazon, purchase a copy of Construction Genius for you and your leadership team. Then have each of the leaders in your organization read one chapter a month and meet for one hour once a month to discuss the chapter and talk about how you can use and apply the information in your construction company today. Each book, you can get the uh, soft cover here I have in my hands if you're watching on video, paperback for uh, 20 bucks. So let's say you have seven guys in your leadership team. Seven times 20 is 140 bucks. You invest that 140 bucks into your leadership team. You're going to get a tremendous return on investment as you read it, use it, and apply it in your business. So go out, grab yourself a copy of Construction Genius. And now back to our conversation with Felipe. I think that's interesting, though, because, you know, I do run across occasionally optimistic people in construction. And yeah, there's one. <laughs> I know, right, right. So I, I know maybe three. <laughs> <laughs> but what's interesting, I, what I like about what you were saying there, Felipe, is that you're not just going in and saying, come on, guys, we can do this. You're right. actually going in with, okay, I acknowledge your pessimism and the value of it. Now let's talk about how we, we, we cannot be constrained by the pessimism in a negative way, but then use it to focus on how we can build the project as profitably and effectively as possible. That's right. And I want everyone to be profitable. Right. I want every, and I tell people like, let's do things that pull the lever to improve your profitability. And at the same time, if I'm going into a job that's already had some challenges, I'll come and say, let's pull some levers to reduce the frustration and stress on this project. Yep. Because what we do is already complex enough. We don't need to add to it and make it harder on ourselves. So sometimes we can do little things to reduce that, that's that stress and frustration. Like one example, we had a job, Eric, that was a schedule challenge and the, the team had been together for over two years. We'd walked the site 
because it's like from a conference room, you're going to know almost nothing. You got to go out there and walk the site. Yep. We walked the site, we realized the way to access the building was difficult. And mm -hmm. so I asked our team, like, as a, as a gesture of goodwill, can we improve site access to the building by creating a path? Even if we pour some temporary concrete so people can walk in, they said, well, we didn't think about that. Like, we didn't realize how hard it was to get in and out. We'd just been used to it because we've been living it for two years. Right. And so they made that move and that bought a tremendous amount of goodwill. We saw productivity on that site increase for every single trade because we made access to the site easier. People could walk on a paved path, you know, versus what they had, the conditions they had before, which was non-ideal. It's very interesting. Okay. So we, we've talked about supply chain. We've talked about the, the labor issues. Um, I'd like to pivot and talk about the, the generational, um, diversity that we have. So like you said, yeah. five generations in the workforce. So let me, let me posit something to you and, and you can push back on it. So my perspective on generational differences is that it's something that consultants like to emphasize in order to make a buck. And what I mean by that is, you know, like, so, so now you, you know, back in the day, it was your yeah. millennial consultant and now it's your Gen Z consultant. And, you know, I get it, but as a consultant, I get it, but I have this, this phrase that always comes into my mind and it's this ballers ball. And what that means is I don't care who you are, where you come from, the color of your skin, your gender, your political persuasion, whatever it is, ballers ball. And I'm always looking for ballers in my organization to build my projects. Are there ballers in every generation? Absolutely. And there's and every generation you have people that identify with the others and they'll say like don't label me. I right. hear that all the time too. People say don't label me. And I'll say okay, but you grew up your cohort of people that you grew up with, your culture is used to certain things that the other generations were not used to right. and still not used to. Right? So one of the things the the key things that I want to show share and this is all public information that you can you can spend like three minutes on your favorite search engine and get some of this, yep. but communication preferences. Yeah. So here, let me just paint you the most dramatic contrast, yep. the traditional generation. So these are people that are within 10 years of retirement. Yeah. You can tell those individuals one time what the goals are for your organization and you never have to tell them again. And they will, they will work towards that goal that you set up like your company's mission, a project's vision one time. Is all you have to tell them once. And and they don't even need to know why. Right. They don't even, sometimes don't even care. Right, right, right. You just said like, this is the result we're trying to go to and they'll drive to that result. Right. Now to contrast to Gen Z, these are people entering the workforce now or who just entered the workforce within the last five years or up even up to 10 years. Some, even some of the later millennials yeah, yeah. fall into this as well. You have to tell them what the result you're driving towards is multiple times a day. If you don't tell them multiple times a day, they don't think it's important. It seems to be less important and they don't trust it, don't believe it, and don't drive towards it. Why is so that there's important? one, that's one major contrast. It has to do with and, and that. I'm not a psychologist <laughs> that I can't answer, Eric, but we, I've even asked some of the, the younger people, like, what's your biggest complaint of, or like, what's one thing you'd want to change working on this project? And they're, it's always an answer around not enough communication. So I don't can I know. Pause it? Can I pause yeah, what I think it is? Absolutely. It's the crack pipe. Okay. <laughs> so he's showing. So for those listening, Eric has just held up his phone, his yeah. smartphone. So, so because what it's done is it's rewired our brains. Like for my generation, it's rewired my brain as a, one of my Gen X, right? So I wasn't born with the internet, but I, I am now locked in. Whereas your Gen Zers, two generations removed from me, they've had this, in, you know, locked into their heads from the very beginning. And the nature of the way this communicates information to us through the scrolling, through the clicking, through the just the rapid dissemination lends itself then to the need for me to communicate multiple times and perhaps in multiple ways with younger generations in order for a message to be locked in. And that's because they've been brought up with this, which communicates information multiple ways and in multiple with multiple messages. What do you think about that? I think that's a really good uh, hypothesis, Eric. And, and there's a lot of, there's a lot of science behind attention 
and uh, I've heard a lot of consultants, especially lately, I'm sure we're going to see a lot of books on this on, on attention and focus. Yeah, right. And there's, there's already been some best selling books on focus yep. <laughs> that that's come out there because there are so many distractions and it is hard to, to lock people in and, and to keep them focused. That's one of the things that we use these lean construction techniques that some of the older generations have complained, like, why do we need to come together and talk about conditions of satisfaction? Like, doesn't everybody just know what we need to do here? Right. And like the, the newer people don't have that information. They don't so have the 25 years or 40 years of experience to know like, what are the drivers? So let me give you another pushback then. So let's say let, I'll buy into what you're saying that someone Gen Z needs to hear a message multiple times a day in order to believe it. Um, but then I'm, you know, I'm a boomer, I'm a Gen Xer and I'm like, I don't care. I'm, I, you know, I'm just going to, I'm going to keep looking for the people who are not like that. Right. So am I looking for unicorns or are there people out there who, though they're Gen Z, they're just old school anyway, and they're going to be able to hear the message once and receive it and act on it. I think uh, a lot of things we see in natural systems will tend to follow a normal distribution curve or a Gaussian curve or a bell curve. Sure. So you're going to find your unicorns, but if you just look at your bell curve, yeah, yeah. that's going to be less than 5% of the total population, yep, yep. less than 5%. And we just talked about earlier in the show over of all the jobs posted in 2022, more than 1 million jobs never even got a response because that's how big the labor gap is yep. for the demand for la for craft and skilled and professional labor and the availability of people that are graduating, going into our fields and entering the construction industry. So I'm going to tell you something, Eric, all the unicorns are already working for somebody. Yeah, they are. So, so <laughs> they're already working. So unless you have a strategy to poach these unicorns, how will you even know? Because if they're working for somebody, they're doing a great job. You're not even going to know that yes. they exist yeah. when, you, when you're searching. <laughs> so then let's talk a little bit more then. Um, in, in your experience, what are some of the most effective strategies for, for the integration of the various generations in a construction company? My favorite thing is uh, this lean principle that we use called making things visual. Mm -hmm. We make it, and we borrow this from the Toyota production systems, just so I can cite my sources here. It's principle number seven, published in the Toyota way, make pro make work visible so no problems are hidden. Mm. That's the exact actual, that's the actual phrase. Make mm. problems, make, make work visible so no problems are hidden. And we found that this speaks across all five generations. When you can take some aspects of your project and make it visual, that gives people something that they can point to and talk to and look at together. And I've, the feedback I've heard from teams and a lot of our teams are mixed. Like we've got people, like I said, that are going to retire within five years or less. And we've got people that just got, you know, they just came from school or they just joined the craft as apprentices. And this is their first project. And when you make things visual, everybody can stand shoulder to shoulder, look at something in front of them and talk to it. They can point to it. It's a much better communication thing for people. The richness, the saturation is so much higher versus just the words or uh, an occasional email or some of the other strategies that companies do or don't use. And most communication, people will say like, even if they were skeptical beforehand, once they do it, the feedback I've heard from all across the five, and we have some project teams that have all five generations working on the same project. Right. The feedback has been like, this is making everything so much easier and better for us. Yep. It's been a lot of thank yous. And even the people that said, this is common sense, but it's like, what are you using? And for anyone listening and you're listening to the show or watching the show and you're like, well, this is common sense. Right. I want you to think about the projects that you're involved in and just try to find it. And it's not going to be common. It's not as common as you think. You need to have an intention and then action with that intention to make it real. So how do I um, create boundaries when it comes to integrating generations from the perspective of, okay, so I want to adapt myself to, let's say the younger generations and this whole topic that we discussed around how they, how they receive information. But what are the lines where I say, yes, I'm going to adapt myself, but at this point, this is where I'm going to stop with that adaptation. And if you don't perform up to my expectations, then there isn't a place for you in this company. How do you, how do you draw those lines, describe those lines? Yeah, I think the best thing to do is negotiation. I'll come at it like a negotiator. 
don't come at it like a dictator. And yes, yes, people, even if you're working in the company, you're like, but I, I run this company. Yeah. Yeah. You run the company, you own the company, you control the company's destiny, but guess what? You're in the same labor market that the rest of us are in. So I think as a starting point, you should say, these are my expectations. So if you're the owner of the company and you're used to just telling people what to do, yep. realize that you're a major constraint in the ability for your company to grow, thrive and adapt. Okay. So instead you can take the position of like, these are my minimum standards, like work hours. This is something that's very contentious among the generations. Like, you know, and especially in construction where there's an expectation unwritten that you should work more than 10 hours a day. Yeah. That's an unwritten expectation that's across true. construction. And it doesn't matter if it's design or project work in the field. Everyone across the industry has this expectation. Yep. The other one we can, the other landmine we can jump on is hybrid work or remote work. We won't jump on that landmine just yet. So I'd say if you're the leader of the company, tell people and be explicit. I don't mean like have it written down in some policy buried in a file cabinet. I mean, tell the person and show them, this is what our expectation is at this organization. Yep. And then ask, and then ask, what do you understand this means to you and then listen to what they say mm. and then say now based on this where are some areas that it would be you would consider it valuable if we were flexible and then listen to what they say and now by asking for them to repeat back what it means to them and then asking where it would be more valuable to them where you could be flexible now you can negotiate you can find you've already found the common ground because they're going to inevitably say things that are lined up with what your expectations are, your minimum expectations. So you've found common ground and now you can negotiate and just know where you as the leader, like what's really important and where you can be flexible. It does not have to be black and white. It does not have to be yes or no. It does not have to be 100% my way and not their way at all. There is, there can be some flexibility. Okay. So, so it's very interesting because I can immediately, I mean, again, I'm just going to push back and say, you know, I need to negotiate with someone that I just hired about how they're supposed to perform. You know, this is, this is your job description and, you know, I'm giving you money. <laughs> so right. here you go. Execute. Right. So this one of the other generational things that these consultants, Eric, they make yeah. a lo real good living telling you. So we see a trend in younger people will go work for a company that has more flexibility, even for less pay. Uh -huh. And so we see the Gen Z will sacrifice pay and also for purpose. Gen Z, the new generation coming in, will work, will take a pay cut compared to like let's say the pay for a certain position is fifty thousand a year. Sure. They will they will come down tens of thousands of dollars for a position if the purpose is, speaks to what they want. They want to have a more meaningful impact for society and they will take pay cuts to have that impact. So it's not money. Money is not a significant enough driver in of itself. There's definitely a, a minimum threshold, but once you meet that threshold, now you're you're competing and it's these other things, these other intangibles, they're going to differentiate you to creating a place that's going to be a magnet for good labor and talent versus repulsing labor and talent. And you're going to struggle. So if you're a company and you're struggling to get people to come work in your construction organization, talk to your recruiting people and see what kind of feedback you're getting from the candidates that pass. And yeah. it's also very common today in this market, Eric, for candidates to receive multiple offers. Yeah. This is an employee's market right now. Yeah. Unless you work for Twitter. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so so landmines. You you brought up a landmine. I I, I want to dive on it. Um it's the hybrid work landmine. Okay. Um so maybe I'm a software developer and I can see building a team with my guys, you know, here, there and everywhere. And it's all good. But construction. Is it feasible right. in I, construction to stick with that hybrid work environment or even the remote work environment? What are your thoughts there? Yeah, my thoughts are I think it's position dependent and it's also construction phase dependent. Yeah, there you go. I think for for most teams and no one's going to disagree with this at some point during the early forming of a team. You've got to have at least one in-person gathering so that people can read each other, get a sense of what they're like. There's certain things that you're never going to experience virtually. Yeah. Like meeting, and we heard this all through, there's thousands of stories about people that got hired and have been working for two years before they finally met in person. Yep. So I think in, in construction, because it's all built on trust, how we work and operate. Yep. And there's no shortcut to trust, but there's definitely things that prevent or slow trust building down. Yes. The sooner we can get together as people at least one time together, 
to create that environment where we can build trust, then we can go hybrid after. It's easier to go hybrid if you have to. And I think that's very true in design, you know, especially brand new teams coming together. It's so critical that that, that initial session, that first kickoff meeting, or some of these early planning meetings happens face to face, shoulder to shoulder. Then after that, you can really flex and, and shift towards a hybrid. Now in the construction phase, there's certain things like the building does not assemble with robots. I'll, I'll Human beings put the building together, yep. right? Now, for as far as the supervision for that, how that can happen, if you're on a, a management team, if let's say it's a 10 person project, do all 10 people have to physically be on site five days a week? No, they don't have to be. Right. So I think depending on your phase, you can flex and have some hybrid work. We saw early in the pandemic when people that could work from home on, const on active construction sites did, their productivity actually increased because they had decreased commute times. Yes. And so there's some, there's some major advantages to letting people have a hybrid environment. And if you hired the right people and you trust them and they trust you, they're not going to be messing around and not working and not being productive. Okay. But if you see, like, if you got hybrid people and they're missing deadlines, they're not yeah. showing up to meetings, that's a wholly different issue right now. I've, there, there is a post, a superintendent, my buddy, Andrew put a post on LinkedIn and he took the position that a construction superintendent on an active construction project site should 100% be able to work remote at, at key times. Right. And his post had like, I don't know, I felt like I'm going to exaggerate, but it seemed like 10,000 people commented and like the vast majority of comments that he was getting to that post were saying like, impossible, can't right. do it. No. And he, he'd given some details and some context of how it was being done. So I think if a construction superintendent can sometimes be remote and we at the bull company have some construction superintendents that are occasionally remote. So like, I'm not making this up. This is not like a made up story. This is right. something real The it can work, but it's got to work with some boundaries so they can be successful. Okay. So I can understand the logic of, of a hybrid work environment for today's project, but help me with this part. There is an aspect of being in person, like you just said, that you can't replace. And I'm curious about the impact of hybrid work environments on the development of junior people. And so let me paint you a scenario here. Okay. So back in the day, and when I say back in the day, I mean, 2019. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a project, yeah. I know I'm a project manager in the office. A phone call comes in from the client. I pick up the phone call and I'm having the conversation in the office. Next door is my project engineer who happens to be in the office at the same time and is listening to the way that I'm handling the issue with the client. I get off the phone, I go into the project engineer's office, and I break down my thought process with them about how I dealt with this issue. The project engineer then gets a valuable learning lesson. Okay, am I painting at least a reasonably yeah. possible scenario here? I've had the same experience. Okay, so <laughs> from that point of view, it strikes me as being one of the issues with hybrid environments is that that scenario is diminished quite a bit. The, the, the frequency of that scenario happening and therefore the development of our junior people is being hindered by the hybrid work environment. Absolutely true. I, I completely agree, Eric. I think if you're not, if you're on a team that's hybrid and you don't have a strategy for how you're going to create that scenario where you can have a shared learning opportunity and you just do the work only, yeah. you are majorly short circuiting the development of your team. Right. Because you're going to get through that project. You might have accomplished everything the project needed, but the, your team coming off of that project will not have grown and have additional skills to move up. And one of the big frustrations of the younger people is they want to see a path to continuous learning and recognition for that learning, sometimes through promotions. But if you don't create that environment where they can have that exposure and you just do the work only, that's not enough to get promoted. So listen, listen to me, people, if you're out there and you just do your job, that is not enough to get promoted, right? To get promoted and move up means that you're increasing your responsibilities and your capabilities. And if you're not in an environment where you're getting exposed 
to somebody with experience where you can have those learnings, then you're going to have a really hard time being able to move up and develop and grow. And you're going to get bored because if I'm just, if I'm an engineer now in a job and all I do is like change orders, like after a project or two, I've got that, I've got mastery of that one thing. Yep. That doesn't mean that I can go supervise or lead work or create strategies to improve project delivery. If I'm just really good at change orders, that's really stifling my development and my capabilities. Okay. So, so I think, let, so let me... the hybrid people listening, you have to, you have to bring people back together at key points. And Eric, one of the things I've heard from some teams that do this is they've made mandatory as an easy start, like to give people some flexibility that really want this, but it's hard to do it. They'll say Fridays is the optional hybrid work from home day. Right. And so people can plan for that. And some other teams will say like every Tuesday and Thursday, we will be on site together. Right. Right. So they set up rules. Those are two different rules for two different types of teams. Sure. That you can set up and think about and then try. So people like, once you set something, like try it a couple of times and then change it if it doesn't work. Right. Don't do it for like two years straight. And if it sucked on the first or second week, like don't keep doing bad stuff, like change it. Yep. Okay. So just in summary, then with this particular point, how can I create continuous learning opportunities in a hybrid work environment for my junior people so they're not getting stagnant and they are developing? Yeah, you start with why it's important for us to be together as a team. And we often find if you just ask people like in your experience, what builds trust and listen to what people say, it's going to be human interaction and say like, there's not like as good as these cameras are, as good as this microphone is, like being able to hear me like that scenario you described, that'd be a great story to share. Right. And if you have a personal, I have so many stories where I heard a PM having a difficult conversation with the client that if had it not been in the trailer with them, I never would have heard it. Or right. being in a conference room where we're negotiating something or having to deliver bad news. Yep. If I had not physically been there, yep. I never would have had that experience and I would not know how to do it. I'd be guessing and reinventing the wheel. So if you share why, start with sharing the why is this important for us? And then share what frequency do we think we want to create for this, for your improvement and development. And then say like, and then the follow on is like, and where can we flex to be, you know, adaptive for you so that it's a give and take. Okay. It's not one way. It's not one direction. And then also uh, older people, what are some of the, the things that the younger generation knows skills that they have that we don't have where they can teach us? We should have them teaching us as much as we're teaching them. It should be give and take. What do you think are the, the skills that younger people do have that we as older folks need to, to, to learn? I've seen like just on the virtual design construction or building information modeling, the ease and comfort of the people coming out of school now, because they're learning these skills in the classroom, yep. uh, even in the trades. Like I, I recently toured the Carpenters Union in Las Vegas mm -hmm. and their training center. Yep. And they have courses where they're teaching the carpenters coming up for training, like how to navigate an augmented reality, virtual reality. And that's just something that's part of their everyday training. Yep. We didn't have that, Eric, you and I didn't have that when we were coming up. Yep. So that's something we're going to either learn on the job or we're going to have to go take a separate course. Yes. But why not learn that from the people that already got that training? They can teach us and we can accelerate our learning and our development. And that's just one example of a technology thing. And there are other things that they're learning as well. Excellent. Excellent. Okay, so we kicked off. We, we were talking about the labor shortage. We did the supply chain. We've talking, talked about generational issues with the hybrid work environment landmine. Um, as we're wrapping up here, what haven't we talked about that we need to talk about, particularly in light of construction in 2023? The one thing I want to showcase, like all the things we discussed, like, and the things we talked about, that's all been countermeasures. And I was like, I got to just plug my book, Eric, like there construction scrum. Hit it. This is, this is the plug, like why, what we're trying to, to offer you in 2023. If you cannot adapt and be agile, you're going to suffer unnecessarily. So people visit my, my link, the felipe.bio.link. You can get, there's free resources. My book is available for free on Kindle unlimited. Uh, so you can read the book. You can download the first section from that links that I've, I've just provided to you. So you can read the, the cool sections on how to get started. Becoming agile and being agile, that's all experimenting and countermeasures to the high uncertainty and complexity in the environment. And these are things that you can start on your project at any phase, 
at any time. And I've got terabytes worth of resources for free. Uh, also check out the ebfcshow.com, like Construction Genius. The Easier Better for Construction podcast is all about featuring the brilliant people in the construction industry to come on and share ideas and real stories of implementations and improvements to how projects are delivered so that you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Learn from others, stand on the shoulders of giants, iterate, be agile, be adaptive, experiment and learn and share the learning. That's how we're going to get better, right, Eric? That's awesome. I really agree with that. And we're going to have links in the show notes to your book. I'm just pulled it up on Amazon here. It's got those, uh, it's got a really high rating there. So congratulations there. Yeah, thank you. And, and we'll make sure to have those sh uh, links in the show notes. So please click on those links and check out the resources and uh, Felipe's po podcast. It definitely is well worth your time. So thank you for coming on the show again. I look forward, I'm going to, I think we should make an annual event of getting you back on for 2024's um, forecast into construction. Thank I you for agree. coming on. <laughs> thank you, Eric. Thank you for listening to my interview today with Felipe. I really enjoyed that. That was a fast hour, wasn't it? Feel free to contact Felipe through the various links in the show notes. Check out his book, Construction Scrum and share the interview with other people that you think would benefit from the content and the information. Finally, I have a request. Can you please give a, the show a rating or a review wherever you get your podcasts? What that does is it helps us to get seen on the internet in terms of spreading the, um, the show through the webs. I'm not quite sure how everything works there, but I know it does. So I'm looking at my page right now. We have 126 ratings and a 4.9 uh, out of five star review. So if you can go to Apple Podcasts and give us a review, um, an honest review, an honest rating, that would be tremendously helpful. I thank you for listening to Construction Genius and blah, blah, blah. <laughs>